Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Norway Chess 2024, a very unique super tournament with a bunch of very strong players, including Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura. This is the round number eight of round number 10 recap. That was said horribly. There's 10 rounds. This is the eighth round recap. Uh, now, a couple of things. Number one, you may notice I'm recording on a potato. This is the worst camera I have ever recorded on. It is the camera that is integrated into my laptop. Some of you may be wondering why. The answer is I'm an idiot. You see, I just went on a little trip and I packed a very nice camera. And I let that camera die by accident. So it has no battery. It is standing up there and I've been staring at it uh, for the last few recaps. So obviously, if you don't know, I'm in Spain for two weeks. Uh, and today I visited Barcelona. I think it's my new favorite city. Incredible weather, incredible scenery. Food is amazing. People are nice. Today I walked 17 kilometers, which is 10 and a half miles, over 20-something thousand steps. Uh, and I vlogged the whole thing, and it is on my Patreon. So among all the other cool stuff that I have been posting, uh, I've been posting vlogs for the first time in my life uh, to a Patreon. So uh, I will also be taking you behind the scenes of my training. Once I go to Madrid, I will be going to Madrid in two days. And uh, then the real fun will begin. So... Let's do some Norway chess in the meantime. By the way, I kind of like not having my camera up there, but, you know, we'll figure that out as well. All right, folks. It's Ding Li Ren versus Fabiano Caruana. It's Ali Reza Firuja versus Hikaru Nakamura. It's Magnus Carlsen versus Prague, the rematch. We're going to get into all of these games. Ju Wenjun played Pia Kramling today. Vaishali played against uh, Anna Muzichuk today. And uh, Lei Ting Jie played against Hampi Konero today. Let's start with the story of Ding Li Ren. Four losses in a row, followed by a premature draw offer, some would say. Uh, and by the way, what is going on with McGregor and Chandler? Can I just like quickly throw that in there? I mean, I've been traveling, so I've been kind of out of the loop. What's that all about? Anyway, Fabiano Caruana plays the King's Indian defense. That's wild. Fabiano Caruana senses danger to such an extent against Ding Li Ren that he plays the King's Indian defense. My friends, people don't play this in classical chess anymore. It doesn't get played because it's way too risky. And after knight c3, not only does Fabiano Caruana not play bishop g7, which is the pure King's Indian defense, he plays bishop f5. This is known as like an old Indian defense. This is how they used to play it to prevent white from playing pawn to e4. Bishop f5 is a crazy committal decision. A crazy committal decision. And right away, it's like, yo, Fabi really wants to win. I mean, look at him creating. I mean, Fabiano would not play like this against any other player in the event. He senses weakness. Ding plays the best way. He plays h3. He plays g4. Ding might be having a bad tournament. He might be having a bad year. He's still Ding. Like, he still knows how to take advantage of positions. And he takes the entire center and the entire space of kingside and is like, Fabiano, I don't know what you're doing. Fabiano plays h5. Ding plays g5, pushing the knight backwards, and simply develops another piece. He now has four pieces, four pawns out to the center or beyond it. Uh, but Fabiano's still playing every move instantly. Okay. Ding plays queen c2. Now we have a6. I mean, Fabiano spending 20 minutes and pushing a pawn to the a6 square is pretty wild stuff. Clearly, he was calculating all sorts of things. You know, your, your knight c6, your c5, your e5, this type of stuff. Now Ding plays this move d5, which disallows Fabiano's knight from developing to c6. And then he trades off his bishop with bishop takes g7. It was not the engine's preferred choice of action, but it's a very logical decision. And then Ding just plays this very solid b3. And Fabiano went to the confessional booth around here and was like, you know, I was worried Ding was going to do stuff like knight to h4 followed by a 4f5, you know, which is like much more violent and much more in the spirit of the development of the position. But it's almost like at some point every game, Ding is just having this moment of like hesitation. And listen, I would know. I have this all the time. Um... And he plays this in just a very restrained way, almost as if saying, like, I don't really want to fight. I kind of want to play a solid game of chess. I'm fine with a draw, just like he did yesterday against Prague. Yeah, Fabi was having none of that. So Fabi took on c4 twice and put his knight on c5. Uh, the computer here really wanted him to play e5 right away, but okay, knight c5. 
Bishop G2, Fabiano takes and continues to try to be provocative with Ding, getting him to take on Poisson, getting him to castle. And I mean, Fabiano has just created an absolute mess. And guess what? He is just worse. I mean, he's just down a full pawn. So Fabi got a position where the engine even thought he was slightly better. At least he was not worse. And yet he continues to try to instigate with Ding to the point that he lands himself in like a totally lost position. I mean, it's plus two. I mean, Ding is just completely plus two. Now, I will say, yesterday on the 30th move, Ding offered a draw. Ding has just made his 30th move. And the game is going on. Ding is just a clean pawn up. Clean. Washed. All right? Knight goes to c6. The rook goes to a4. I mean, Ding is doing everything right. It is plus 2.2 in this position. Now what the computer wants is the knight to go f... Uh, to, now uh, the knight to go to f4 put pressure on the bishop and the pawn, and replace the knight with this knight on d5, right? And slowly win the game. Instead, Ding goes here, followed by here, which also makes sense because he's targeting the knight, and now the game can continue with something like rook to d1, targeting this, and the game, you know, the game proceeds. But we have bishop f1, and Ding offers a draw. He offers a draw because we're going to get rook c4, a knight is coming to f3, and you're either going to lose this pawn or this pawn, and the game just ends in a draw. I mean, I don't know what's happening, but he didn't lose. Okay, two games in a row. We're getting a little bit of stability, but Ding had a fantastic position in this game. He, he like, refused to play it aggressively in the opening by playing b3. Fabiano went to the confessional booth and was like, I can't believe he did this. Like, and then Fabiano just really, really wanted to lose, so he tried. Uh, and Ding was like, I'm not having any of it. So we go to arm again, right? Now, Ding desperately needs to win a matchup. I mean, he, he, he's won in this event before, uh, I believe, in Armageddon. And uh, in this game, he gets just a very, very straightforward kind of English-ready position where white is going to take on c5 at some point or not. There it goes. And now this move knight to e1. And I mean, Ding just has a very nice positional pressure here. The knight is going to e1 and d3, and it's going to go to f4. Fabiano plays c4, and that was just much worse for a second game. Plays bishop b4, Ding goes queen c2. The game is just much, 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 much worse. Bishop d5 is a completely free pawn. Ding takes it. I mean, he's just winning. Again, cb. Now, queen e4 is the critical move. The idea of queen e4 is to put pressure on this. Black's move, rook c1 is possible. And then white has to find bishop c1. This is very scary. And if you're having a bad event, it's very easy to think you're going to blunder here. But you actually just play bishop b2 and black is completely lost. You have queen e5, you're, hang you're threatening the bishop and you're threatening this bishop. And if something like bishop takes d5, rook d5, rook takes, queen b4, all this stuff. Even queen b4 now threatening the knight is winning. Uh, and ding has a totally crushing position. But he thinks for a bit and he plays bishop here. And now after rook c2, all the pieces get traded. And Fabiano is a piece down. But... He's going to queen. He goes here, and the players just repeat moves. And it doesn't matter. I mean, if Ding plays bishop a1, he gets hit with knight b3. And he's going to lose the bishop. So Fabiano wins in the Armageddon, and Ding loses another matchup. But he gets on the, he gets on the board, just like yesterday against Prague. But this tournament can't end soon enough. And um, I don't know. There's not much more to say, you know? Like, I, I've been saying it every recap, and... The chess world has sort of like gotten into a place where now everybody publicly is sort of saying they feel a bit bad and, you know, they just wish him nothing but the best and a recovery and everything. And, and that's sort of how I feel as well. I mean, I'm not going to say anything new. Now, Ju and June, Pia Kramling. Uh, very, very positional game. E3, Bishop, D2, Nimso. This was played by Hikaru earlier in the event against Prague. Bishop, D3, Knight, E2. Some of you may be thinking, this is a free pawn. You're right. You're actually completely right. This is clearly some sort of prep. The engine is not convinced, but this is a very weak computer, and the stronger one uh, thinks that, um, yeah. I mean, Ju and Jun basically is trying to bait her opponent into a huge fight. She knows that Pia uh, prefers kind of solid positional play, which is why Pia goes d5. She does not indulge in, in any of that. C, D, E, D. And now White begins operating with this move f3 and e4 
This is a very standard idea in the Queen's Gambit declined. There it is as well. Another idea, g4, trying to advance, put the knight behind the pawn, maybe push these pawns. This is all very standard stuff uh, in various QGD positions. And now she brings the queen behind all of those pawn openings, puts it on h4. Black is doing exactly what you should be doing in a game like this, striking back at the center. Knight d7, knight f8, bringing yet another piece to the party. And now here comes h4. I mean... Ju and Jun is playing this game like Fabiano played against Ding Li Ren. I mean, he, she is just going for a fight. That is what she is trying to accomplish in this position. Knight goes to e6, king goes to h1, and watch as she just makes necessary preparations. She doesn't touch the center because the center is solid. Some of you also may be wondering, why is black not playing a move like c4? A locked center benefits the attacking side generally, so if black tried to do something like this, white may actually very well be faster, right? And now the engine disagrees. The engine is thinking like, no, there's going to be some serious problems here for white. Like, white doesn't have an attack. But as a human, you know, this looks a little bit scary. And so b5 is what uh, she plays. a3, you know, Ju and Jun making necessary preparations. And just a few, few moves from uh, white's side now make the attack a little bit more powerful. So Pia tries to open the position and plays this very creative move, knight to c5. This is a very nice idea. The idea of knight c5 is that if you take take, the bishop hits the queen, then the rook, and then the pawn opens and hits this. Which is why Ju and Jun says no thank you. And why Pia puts the knight on e4. This is excellent counterplay being created. Knight e4, d e4, pawn to e3 wins a queen. So you have to spend the tempo blocking it. Now the rook comes to the party. Ju and Jun continues with f5. Very double-edged game. Ju and Jun showed up today ready to win or lose. Bishop to b3. We trade. Bishop b8, she's also trying to create bishop counterplay. Knight to e2. Now bishop d5 looking to trade the bishops. Well, that's it. I mean, Ju and Jun's pieces have been completely traded. But she continues pushing with f6. Black now down to 20 seconds. Pia has 20 seconds to make 10 moves. Or she's going to lose on time. And she could have actually played, believe it or not, this move. And after bishop takes h6, she's down a pawn, but actually she's safe. But she plays knight e6, and she, I mean, she literally has 20 seconds. And because she's responding instantly, the best move is knight g7, king g7 loses. It loses to kind of a straightaway queen f6 and queen f7 threat. And she gets herself, unfortunately, into too low of a time, and it's just checkmate on the board. The queen g7 is mate, uh, and if you play knight e6, there's queen f7. There's a discovered check, but unfortunately, nothing to be done. 96, and she simply resigns because she's going to lose her pieces. Again, she had to make every one of those moves in like two seconds because otherwise she was going to lose on time. It was a very double-edged game, and right at this critical moment, I mean, Pia basically just had, you know, four minutes uh, for uh, 11 moves and a big attack in coming, and, and, and she just played 96, and that's it. I mean, not even that's it. She, if she had taken back on G7 with the knight, but I mean, I think just time-wise, I mean, 21 seconds to make 10 moves, it's... In a position like this, it's not very possible. And Ju and Jun gets a very nice win, well-deserved win, and she pushes her lead in the tournament. Um, Firuja versus Hikaru. Earlier in the event, Hikaru won a very nice game against Firuja. I'm not making that up, right? He won an Armageddon, excuse me, against, uh, against Firuja earlier in the event. Uh, this game, we have an Italian, and Hikaru plays this line H6. He played this also against, uh, I think, Fabiano. Uh, in this event, he, he, he's been, again, it's candidate prep. You play h6, you stop anything from going to g5. You either play g5 yourself or you play g6. Both of these systems are actually quite strong. Uh, Ali Reza plays in a way I've never seen before. He plays b4. Now, it all makes sense. I mean, of course, b4 is a very logical move. Uh, but generally, I thought white is trying to, you know, quickly push for, for d4, especially if the bishop comes to c5. But okay, b4, obviously, completely sensible. And Hikaru now plays bishop b7. And that, that, uh, that's very interesting. He does not want the bishop to be attacked like this. He plays bishop e7, completely unique territory. Like, if he wanted to play bishop e7, why did he allow b4? I don't know. The difference is he could have played it right away. Ali Reza just begins taking as much space as possible on the queen side. This game be be becomes absolute madness. Knight to b8, completely getting out of the center. Hikaru has played like this before. Now the queen goes back to a2, sidestepping various things. And... Um, and, uh, whoops, I don't know what I clicked. Sorry, you didn't see anything, but on my side, I accidentally clicked and, and uh, another window popped up. 
b5, like my OBS popped up where I was recording bishop g4, and uh, this game gets very exciting. Hikaru, look at this, sacrifices a pawn. This is, a, this is an alpha zero idea. Like, this is a fascinating idea. Giving up a pawn and either getting white to give up his bishop, which is just losing because of this, um, or getting white to block his own center. And then you play here, and suddenly it's like, white doesn't feel like he's up a pawn. And black is going to create an attack. And watch as Hikaru, you know, again, white's position is actually kind of tough to play. Hikaru just gets to this situation and just starts bringing in his pieces. Knight h5, g4. It's crazy how Lirasa played g4, but the thing is, you know, if white plays like knight d2, I mean, black is going to just start... It's going to be like an avalanche. So, g4... Knight comes to f4, and Hikaru is just, I mean, dominating Ali Reza on the king side completely. Like, somehow this bishop feels like it should be trapped, and yet it's the aggressor. And here comes h5 by Hikaru. I mean, Hikaru completely dominating with black. Gh5. Hikaru is two pawns down. f5 now. Taking more space away from the knights. Queen g5 ideas. Rook f6, rook h6. Taking here ideas. Like, knight f6, knight h5. I mean, so many different ideas. The engine just wanted him to play knight f6 or rook e8. I mean, both of those moves also make sense. It likes rook e8, rook e5, and then maybe potentially rotating over here, right? He does it like this, and Ali Reza now starts playing his own pawn sacrifices, looking to create some openings over here, right? There's the rook under attack. Hikaru is still better position, looking absolutely dominating here. Ali Reza playing c4, looking to fork the pieces. The bishop sneaks out. The pawn continues moving forward. And now Hikaru trading off the pieces. Knight takes d5. We take a sigh of relief. We count the pawns. Both sides have six of them. Hikaru must be better here. I mean, his position looks spectacular. He is better. Bishop c4. Ah, the computer really wanted him to defend with the pawn. It didn't want him to move his rook to the center. He plays rook d8 and gets out of the center like this. But now Ali Reza has time to activate his queen. You see, if we got c6, queen e1, right? And, and this is the way he tried to do it. Maybe this is also okay, but at least this way queen h5 happens and you never really move your rook away and if something like queen to e5 like the game, you at least have rook e8 and the rook can maybe come down here in the future. But what happens this way is that the rook has to play defense and by playing defense with the rook, suddenly Hikaru is forced to go into a series of exchanges and we end up in a rook and knight end game where still black is doing a little bit of pressing but it's just not enough. Rook c5 is a fork, rook f5. The dust settles. Ali Reza, I would say, survives. I mean, he fought back, but this felt more uh, like a survival, and the players agreed to a draw in this position because they are going to trade into an endgame. So, crazy game. I mean, that did not look like an e4. e4. Look, like, look at this position. I mean, just insane fighting chess by the players. Pawn clusters, queens in the corner, queen and bishop hunting down the king, both bishops infiltrating, like... You know, and uh, and black was better, but ultimately it ends in a draw, which means we go to Armageddon. E4, E5. Hikaru saying, I have the black pieces. I'm going to play the exact same way. Let's see where we deviate. D6, knight B8, queen A2. I mean, okay. So 11 moves of the previous game, right? 11 moves, 11 moves. Completely same position. In classical, Hikaru played this move, bishop to G4. This time, he plays c6. So he changes the line so Ali Reza cannot, uh, cannot memorize anything. Knight d2, and now he plays bishop g4. Bishop h5, d5. So he plays for a similar type of idea. Here's the problem. After c, d, c, d, bishop b3, this pawn's a huge weakness. And after knight d7, Ali Reza doesn't even have to take that pawn. He could have even taken on d5. But he does it this way. And I think Hikaru, again, tried to get some sort of attack going, uh, but this one is significantly harder to get going. And Ali Reza just very quickly just rolls forward and, uh, and, and, and doesn't even really take much risk. I mean, he, he's just dominating here positionally. A5 is weak, B7 is weak. And I mean, you compare the two positions, you know, you compare move 25, and, but like this is move 25 of the classical game, and this is move 27 of, of this game. And uh, you can see the difference. Uh, then Ali Reza here, bishop c2 was a ridiculously creative defensive move, and, and Hikaru just tricks Ali Reza like, knight a5 just defends the bishop. And he's just going to be up a pawn. Uh, but instead of that, Ali Reza gives up like all the advantage, but continues to have the pressure. Rook uh, a1 here was a winning move, which is completely unfindable, trying to defend the pawn tactically. 
Uh, but ultimately, again, Hikaru just doesn't have the time. And uh, he unfortunately blunders, and uh, Alireza wins all the pawns, and he wins the Armageddon in a very deserved fashion, up three minutes on the clock. He maintained his time advantage from start to finish. The Armageddon does not work out in Hikaru's favor, and Ali Reza gets the job done. Very well done um, from him. Vaishali versus Anna Muzuchuk. This one was a Jobava London. Vaishali mixing it up, playing some crazy openings because the last two rounds did not go her way. She has this very odd pawn formation in the center. She's trying to get Anna to take her, uh, and Anna doesn't do that. She does not oblige. Uh, the thing is, in this position with no bishops and such a close structure, White tries to put a little bit of pressure, but it's kind of a frozen situation in the center of the board. Very quickly, the queens come off, and the structure gets locked, and uh, there's no way into Black's position. There's just no way in because of the structure. It's not, it's not a mobile pawn structure. Black is very passive, but completely fine. And again, you see Vaishali here trying to make some sort of progress, but there is no progress to be made. Uh, Black just sits, sits and waits. Now, DC closes off the entire C file, so obviously nothing is going to happen. And uh, quite soon we will probably get to a drawn position as Muzuchuk. Yeah, I mean, this is just, you know, if, actually, if anything, after here, uh, Rook B8 followed by B5. And actually, maybe Black is the one playing for a win, but she hesitates, gives White a chance to kind of blockade. She's going to go for B5 at some point, I would imagine. No, they, they just repeat the moves. So. Yeah, I mean, Anna suffered the whole game. It was actually kind of surprising she didn't try to push for b5, but okay, now she has a job, and her job is to hold the Armageddon. And this time, Vaishali changes the opening completely. She's like, I'm not happy with how that went, so I'm going to play a four knights Spanish. Very imbalanced game now happens. Very imbalanced structure. You kind of see Anna, like, getting aggressive here and, you know, damaging White's pawn structure. Uh, but White gets a big center, right? Bishop g5, and we get a closed position where white tries to attack the light squared pawns, right? Bishop b7, rook c1, very nice position, trying to target that queen side. Black plays c5, gambits a pawn. She did not blunder it. I think she just didn't like what was incoming. I think she didn't like, for example, queen b6 just loses to pawn takes pawn. If bishop takes, I take this. If this, just knight d5, and you resign. So you resign because knight c7 with the rook. I will explain it to you. So white just goes a pawn up. And now what white is going to probably do is put the knight on c4, a4, knight b5, maybe pawn to f4. Like, let, let, let's see the way Vaishali does this. Rook e1, okay, she, you know, she's playing on the light squares. h4 is not how I would have done it. I would have probably gone knight d2 and tried to play for knight c4. She does it her own way, but her own way... <laughs> Uh-oh. h5? Armageddon is crazy because now, I mean, Anna just taking over. f5, ef, rook f5. Vaishali trying to act like it's all cool, but the position is amazing for the bishops. Look at black's light squared bishop on a6. Queen c7 is an inaccuracy here. Maybe being aggressive would have been a bit better because this allows uh, the rook to transfer and an attack to begin. Bishop to g5. Now she trades. Queen e6 check. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's Armageddon. I mean, everything is chaos in Armageddon. Everybody blunders in Armageddon. Suddenly the base pawn of the black position falls apart. Now the bishop is gone. Now... In this position, rookie four, and one of these two moves just wins because you end up picking up the pawns, but it's b4. And I mean, black is still probably like losing, but it's equal, but rook c4, now rook c5, and uh, now white is just gonna push the b pawn. And both players here play with five seconds on the clock. I mean, it's complete chaos. They're hitting the clock. They're not losing on time because it's one second bonus. It's equal, it's not equal. It was winning for white, now it's fortress. And in this position, Anna Muzuchuk loses on time. <laughs> so Vaishali went back to her hotel room and was like, yo, I just flagged this girl. <laughs> yeah, Anna, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I guess King G8, she saw something she didn't like. She didn't like that white can get in with the rooks. She probably saw like rook C8. You know, if King H7, like this is mate. And, uh, she, you know, she wasn't sure about King F7, so she didn't go for it and she lost on time. Now, there was Lei Tingdie versus Humpy, and then we have Magnus versus Prague. Lei Tingdie. All right, we have uh, a Queen's Gambit accepted with E4. There are a lot of lines here for black. B5 is the most aggressive. E5 is very positional. Not a lot of people are playing the E4 Queen's Gambit accepted nowadays because they're nerds. Because they're nerds. They're dorks. They, they don't like to play like this. Um... This, this becomes a very sharp and open battle. E, D, 4, Knight, D, 4, very sharp. Bishop, C, 4. Actually, Humpy played this move, Knight, D, 7. And uh, it must be some sort of prep because I've never seen it. And you see the low-depth engine here really doesn't like it. 
It doesn't like it because of the move bishop takes f7. Which it claims after king f7, queen b3 check, something like king e... Oh, king f8 would be bad because queen b4, queen, that would hang up, queen. But if something like king e8, I mean queen b4, there is c5. So it, it likes the position after king e8 somehow. Uh, but okay, white plays f3. I mean, she plays f3 almost without thinking. Castles, castles. And uh, now, now we begin a middle game. So... Bishop f6, Humpy allows the damaging to her pawn structure. The knight goes to a4 to kick the queen away. The queen does get kicked away. Now we kick out the bishop. All right, knight b5. Trying to take the bishop, damage the structure. Black goes rook d8, doesn't want the structure damaged. We don't care about the damaging of the structure. What we care about is an attack. That's what we're trying to get. Knight c3, knight to d5. Maybe the bishop gets to the c2 square. Maybe we bring the rook. Knight c3, very, very solid position, right? Okay, now we're trying to play pawn to f4. Knight f4, rook d1, because we want to fight back on the d-file here from Lei, right? It's a very stable position, but white is better because of the pawn structure. Now she trades. She trades because she replaces the rook very quickly. And now, a very smart decision from Lei. Lei realizes, I'm not going to be able to attack, because we're going to, you know, head to a queen trade. However, I have the only open file on the board, and I have a better pawn structure, which means my pawns and my pieces are more mobile. And watch as Lei Tingjie plays a masterclass of a game. She plays bishop f1, getting the bishop out of the way of the knight. She puts the rook immediately on the seventh rank. She kicks out the knight of her position. She, of course, doesn't hang a rook. The knight goes back. She doesn't allow the knight to move. She is threatening the move f5. King f8, by the way, f5 doesn't quite work because knight e5. So, okay, you don't play f5. You just bring your king. The pawns are doing their job controlling. Bishop to e2. You take, you know, keeping the tension or playing e5 also would have probably worked, but she does it this way. And uh, look at this. I mean, just amazing. Creating four isolated targets. Bishop goes back to d7 and just, just bringing the king. Slowly. Pawn to f6. Not necessary, by the way, but in low time, she tried to force it. King g5 here is just winning for white. You threaten the pawn, and after take, take, you just have an outside passer. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a very tough endgame to hold. Uh, okay, she plays f6, and in low time, things happen. King f3, you couldn't play rook takes bishop because rook takes bishop, and then I take the rook. So this is a totally winning endgame. Outside pass pawn, weaknesses all over the board. Here comes the king, and that is the end. You simply cannot defend against this. And uh, after a few more moves, it's back to equal. <laughs> Time trouble. Both players have less than a minute. Rook e8, rook g5. This was all winning. Uh, and then rook e1 is just the move you didn't have to play because rook, rook, rook e1, it didn't change anything. You can just play king g6. Uh, and like, for example, e2. Now you can play rook e1 because you're threatening to take the pawn with the promotion. But if black played, for example, king d4, uh, I think king f7. Maybe she calculated king g7 was, was some sort of draw, but, but it's, it's, it's fine. I mean, king d3 h8 like i i don't know what what she didn't like here with the two pawns going i don't know maybe she thought it was a draw but she didn't have a huge amount of time she plays rook e1 and now apparently the game is back to equal but king g7 king d2 is a losing move <laughs> and games are so tricky you have to start giving checks or you have to play uh yeah you have to you have to start giving checks like rook e7 and then and then king d2 rook e7 then king d2 she goes here and now the rook goes back to h1, and this is winning because take, king takes, and you do not have time to do everything you need in the position. And Lei wins. Lei almost didn't win. She almost snatched a, a draw, or yeah, she almost snatched a draw from the uh, jaws of victory. But she gets the job done. A deserved win with a little bit of chaos. I mean, everybody gets low on time and does completely crazy things. And that brings us to our last game of the day. Magnus Carlsen versus Pragnananda. Prague defeated Magnus earlier in the event, so this would be a very interesting game to see how Magnus will try to attack the young man. Bishop to b5 is the Spanish, knight to f6. Um, I don't know what happened here. I don't know why Prague spent a minute on the first move of the game playing e5, but maybe he was just remembering his openings, or maybe he was meditating. And this is the open Spanish, knight takes e4. So it's an open Spanish. Black is now going to rely on b5, d5. The board is going to get very open. There's b5, there's d5 d5, bishop e6. Now white has many approaches, which generally involve playing c3 and knight bd2. Uh, Magnus doesn't do that. He plays queen e2 and rook d1 and then c3. So he plays this setup 
and then he has to commit these pieces or play bishop here, putting pressure on the center. Black's counterplay is completely and only associated with the f-pawn. So if Black was not able to move the f-pawn for the rest of the game, he would get into massive trouble. If he had to leave the center, White would play bishop c2 and generate a massive attack. So he plays f5, Magnus takes on Passant because he's a cultured man, knight bd2, I literally just said that move, and we get to a position of relative stability just in a moment. Uh, this is the position of relative stability. So white has an interesting structure. So does black. Black has a four on three and a two on three. White has doubled pawns. White has a target over here. White is pinned down the center line. And maybe in the long run, it's black's king who's going to be weak. So Prague tries to trade pieces because he's that knight is not particularly great. It's not doing a whole lot. So we trade. And now we play a4, trying to target those weaknesses on the queen side. Prague plays c6. And around this point, Prague went to the confessional and was like, you know, my position's unpleasant, but I think it's completely holdable. Like, I think this is not really the position you want to play against Magnus, um, but it's holdable. So now Magnus repositions his queen and his rook. So he wants the queen with the bishop on the diagonal. He also wants the queen on the d-file. He wants the rook on the e-file. Bishop g6. Again, you notice how Prague is just trading off his pieces. Magnus trades, the queen goes away from the center, and now he says, okay, let's trade the next bishop. I'm going to play over here. That's what I'm going to do. And we're going to both battle for the eight. Now, here, Prague plays a ridiculously sophisticated move. Prague's move here is outlandish. It is counterintuitive. It is so many different things. He takes his beautiful structure and he splits it. He splits it, which is why he spent so long, you know, getting here. It's because white is in a pickle. He has to take with the queen. He is not able to take with the rook. If he takes with the rook, he loses the rook. So he has to take with the queen. And now look at this c5 move. That defends that, and this is going to become a pass pawn. I mean, this is going to simplify into one on nothing. And a couple of moves later, that is exactly what he does. He basically just chucks these pawns. They're not hanging, but, you know. And the idea is if you play queen c5, he's just going to play d3, d2. And, and this is a genius play from Prague. Genius. Counterintuitive play. The pawn is now a passer, and suddenly it's Magnus who is defending. He can take on a6, but he doesn't want to. He wants to go for this pawn instead. Queen a6, and the pawn's just too good. b4, h6, just making sure there's no back rank checkmate. The pawn gets to d2, and that's it. I mean, with the black is too active. And what Prague is going to do is trade, win the b-pawn, and lose the d-pawn. Draw. This is a, a drawn end game. It's a drawn end game uh, because white has doubled pawns. If, if white had a three on two, we already saw Magnus win this earlier in the event. Remember when he won against Ali Reza, three on two end game, uh, getting him low on time. First of all, Prague doesn't get low on time. Second of all, the pawns are doubled. So there's no way to get them through. And uh, we see that because, you know, Prague just sits back. It does become a two on one, but there, you, you can't make progress in this position. He tries, he tries, he tries, he tries. He tries and tries and tries, and he actually does get here, which looks really promising, but his pawn has not crossed. The king is still on the sixth rank, so Prague just plays rook f8. And when you, have a, when you are defending against the g and h pawn, you can actually just play corner defense. So this is another way of defending. g and h pawns are basically unwinnable rook and pawn endgames if the king and rook are like this in front of the pawn. So this is like cocoon defense. There is no way to get the king out of the corner. If the king was on this, right, then there is, but this is a very famous draw and uh, very well done from Prague. Prague has played fantastic chess against Magnus in this tournament. Unfortunately, it's not over. There is still an Armageddon to be played. d4 knight of six and Magnus says, let's go for a London. Now let's change it up to a queen's gambit because he played bishop f5 and I studied the Gotham course and in the Gotham course he tells me to go for the b7 pawn. Thank you, Magnus. I do agree. It is an excellent course for beginner and intermediate players and even advanced players trying to perfect their London skills. You just play very positional queen's gambit style chess. Your opponent plays a6 trying to create counterplay, b5 and c5 trying to create counterplay. You take, you put the knight in the center and bishop to f3 and white just has a very small pleasant advantage He's going to play a few moves like this and put some pressure. There's rook c1. By the way, a mistake rook a7. The top engine move here is rook c8. But if you don't want to do that, bishop h5 is a crazy move, sniping the bishop into the rook. So rook a7. And now Magnus gets the knight on c6. That was a very nice idea. Knight to e5. You can't take the rook because if knight takes f3. And it was better there for a moment. But Prague is just... I mean, queen b8 is crazy. And Magnus continues to pose problems, but Prague has basically completely equalized at this point. 
Still, there is pressure on the A pawn, and that is what Magnus is going to try to take advantage of, right? Bishop f3, he's got all the pieces going. Now he takes on d5 and plays this move b3, and right here, Prague has to make a couple of good decisions. And the good decisions are not easy. He plays rook c7. Clever idea, knight to e6. That's a check made, by the way. Queen d4, knight d4. And this is just not an easy endgame. Black has two weaknesses and white has one. And that's basically what this is going to come down to. In a minute and a half time advantage, right? Bishop c2 looking for counterplay. Rook c1, rook f1 was even better. Bishop d3. And Magnus just says, look, you have two weaknesses and I have one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put my king right on d2. I don't care if it's equal according to the computer. It's not really, you know, this is a very difficult endgame to defend. Bishop goes back to d7. King b2, king c3, knight e2, puts the king in the center. And now Prague clears out. Prague's drawing. He's actually done it. I mean, the absolute mad lad has done it. This is an extremely unpleasant endgame to play. And Prague decides he has to lose the pawn. And time will become a factor in this game as Magnus dominates him on the dark squares, continues to ask questions, and finds knight to d7. The extraction technique here for white is so ridiculous. You have to put your king there, knight d7 to force the king this way, and then bring your king closer, and then reposition your knight. Look at the way Magnus does this, like a freaking surgeon. Look at that. Knight here, knight b7, knight d6, Knight f7. Unbelievable. e6, black is boxed in. He loses because the king cannot stop the pawn from promoting. <laughs> the way Magnus wins this endgame is just complete magic. It's an equal endgame, but he maneuvers and he finds this. It's just otherworldly. Like, I don't even know what to say. It's bananas. Uh, folks, after eight rounds of action in the women's side, Ju and June is winning by one and a half points. Anna Muzichuk at this point in second place, and uh, Vashali and Leia are tied. Vashali has slowed down a bit. It's Ju and June's tournament to lose, I would say. And uh, Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru still separated by one point. Hikaru losing in Armageddon today. Hikaru, uh, Magnus winning in Armageddon today. But it's close. A win in classical for either of these guys could do it, folks. Uh, sorry for the potato camera quality. It's 12.45 in the morning here uh, where I am in Spain. I'm going to get some rest. Thanks for watching. Vlog will be up on the uh, Cameo. Very excited about that. And uh, more behind-the-scenes content on the way as well. Appreciate y'all very much. And uh, get out of here. You know the drill.